Whoa, whoa, slow down. They're bombing where? And who who's leading? Fuchida? The Pearl Harbor guy? Wow. February 20th, 1942. It's been described as Britain's Gibraltar of the East, a mighty marine fortress that ties India with Australia. But whatever else it is, from this week, it's in Japanese hands. This week, Singapore falls. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Germans brazenly sailed major ships up the English Channel. Other Germans were surrounded in the Soviet Union, and yet other Germans were making life miserable on Malta. But the big news was the Japanese invasion of Singapore Island, which continues this week. On the morning of the 15th, British commander Arthur Parsifal meets with his command. They have basically one day's supply of food, water, and ammunition. They all agree that no counterattack is possible. At 5.15 p.m., Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita receives Parsifal at a Ford Motors factory in the west of the city. Yamashita demands surrender. Parsifal asks to keep a thousand armed men to maintain order, but Yamashita thinks he's just playing for time, so he demands a flat-out answer in English. Are they surrendering, yes or no? The surrender of Singapore is signed just after 6 p.m. In the whole Malayan campaign, the Japanese lost fewer than 10,000 men. The British and Imperial forces lost as many as 138,000, 80,000 of them prisoners of war. The casualty number, not the POW number, may be inflated in its count of the volunteer forces. The ratio of wounded to killed here is less than 2 to 1 and likely less than 1.5 to 1, whereas in the war in Europe, it had been up to 4 or even 5 to 1. This illustrates the brutal nature of the combat here and the prospects for the wounded. The Japanese have had total air superiority and were the only side that had tanks. They were also better trained and better led. They planned the Malayan campaign to take 100 days. It's taken 70. This is the greatest disaster so far in British military history. Well, it sure is, according to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. But you know, there is no official inquiry into the Malayan campaign and the fall of Singapore. There are a bunch of reasons for this, one being that defeat is not exactly uncommon for the British so far this war, and this also being at the other end of the world from London, and with Rommel's big advance in North Africa two weeks ago, it isn't exactly top priority to the average British citizen. Certainly not as high priority as the Blitz was. Or how about those Germans sailing three big old warships right up the channel last week, right? It's different for the Japanese. I mean, Singapore is that big pearl of a city not far across the water from Japan. Yamashita becomes known as the Tiger of Malaya, and this is a major victory. On the 17th, the European prisoners are marched off to a barracks, and the 55,000 Indian prisoners are kept separate. The Japanese will try to convince these men to join the INA, an Indian national army that will, theoretically so far, work for Indian independence while cooperating with the Japanese. I suppose we'll see how that goes in future. As for the locals, summary executions put a quick end to any thoughts of looting. Public beheadings also help with restoring order, but Yamashita believes that the Chinese are enemies of Japan, so he orders the city combed for hostile Chinese. What exactly he orders to be done to them, and how much of what is done he is aware of, is not entirely clear. But the Japanese perform Sukching, purification by elimination. Beginning now on the 18th, Chinese males are rounded up and screened. Any civil servants, teachers, communists, any who have a triad tattoo or who speak with a Hainanese dialect, which the Japanese consider automatically communist, are no more. Finito. Exactly how they are eliminated is not so easy to determine because of a lack of survivors. This also happens to an extent in the whole Malayan Peninsula. Modern historians put the number eliminated at 50,000 in Singapore and 20,000 or so in other places. It's easy to blame Parsifal for the whole Singapore debacle, but it isn't that fair. 
The first thing to be acknowledged is that no British Army commander in the war was so comprehensively let down by both the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. Further, his superiors chained him to the mission of the defense of Singapore as a naval base and failed to provide adequate air power, yet dictated the dispersal of his forces to protect air bases. But he was still beaten, and beaten badly by an enemy he outnumbered in both men and equipment, and he had way better logistics. But he never managed to concentrate his force at major and decisive points. A lot of the leaders below him also completely failed in their missions. There was a wave of trying to blame the Indian and Australian troops themselves for the failures, but that's baloney. Heck, as several sources note, at least half the Japanese killed on the island were killed by Australians. One major sad but true factor is that once France and the Netherlands were taken by the Germans in 1940, Britain had no realistic hopes of stopping Japanese actions on the Asian parts of the British Empire. There is also the training and experience and the leadership of the Japanese, which was all way better than that of the defenders, and the fact that they used operational doctrines that suited the terrain. The British were roadbound. The Japanese used bicycles and horses to just go around them on the march south. But other than prestige, how much of a loss is it really to the British Empire? It seems straight from the get-go to be a bigger loss to someone else. China. Chiang Kai-shek's and the Nationalist Army's only remaining land link with the Allies is the Burma Road. And its defense rests very simply on the idea that the Japanese will be stopped before they can take Malaya and Burma. If the road should be closed, that spells real, real trouble for the Chinese. Something that could have been truly game-changing, but does not happen, has to do with a purple machine. Purple is one of the Japanese secret codes and has been cracked by the Allies. A British-built purple machine analog has been in Singapore since December, but what has happened to it remains unknown. Maybe it was destroyed, maybe just not recognized for what it was by the Japanese troops, but if it had been captured by the Japanese, if they knew that the Allies had not just cracked their codes, but had even rebuilt one of their cipher machines, what would that have done to Axis security in general? I mean, the British have cracked several Enigma codes, and that is like 100% because people get sloppy with security practices because they think their codes are impenetrable. A captured, allied-built purple machine would stop that pretty instantly. The implications of this disaster are not confined to the Asia-Pacific area. The single most important insight into Hitler's strategic thinking was delivered to the Allies by the dispatches of the Japanese ambassador in Berlin. An overall upgrade of Axis communication security methods might well have defeated or at least severely curbed the Allied success in this arena. Another unpleasant residual of such a disaster would have been to deliver a body blow to the willingness of American codebreakers to collaborate with their British counterparts. Well, that is all a what if. But what is also happening now is the Japanese are invading Sumatra. This equatorial island is some 1,600 kilometers long, and the capital, Palembang, is to the south. The oil fields that stretch north of the city produce around 40% of the oil of the Dutch East Indies, and that goes to two big refineries near the city. And oil is a big reason the Japanese went to war. The Allies have also successfully sabotaged the refineries at Borneo and the Celebes, so the invaders really need to take some local refining. There are two airfields near Palembang, and Allied planes have operated out from here since Singapore got too hot for them. They have around 85 planes at the fields, and a few hundred British and local men in terms of local defense. On the 14th, 150 Japanese planes, including transports with 240 paratroops and bombers to drop supplies for them, arrive on the scene, and after some chaotic dogfights, manage to land and take one of the refineries intact. The other is mainly destroyed. Later in the week, another big load of Japanese planes is sent out to bomb Darwin, Australia. The morning of the 19th, 
just before 10 a.m. The carriers Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, and Soryu, with battleship support, raid Darwin with 188 planes, five more than the first attack wave at Pearl Harbor in December, but again led by Mitsuo Fushida. This attack is to support landings on Bali and Timor. Nearly half the town has evacuated, but there are some 50 ships at the harbor there. This wave, and a smaller second one around noon, sinks seven merchant ships, an American destroyer with its crew of 91, two smaller naval ships, and destroy 17 combat planes. They do damage to around half the ships present though, wreck a lot of the port infrastructure, and kill up to 250 people. This raid, the first air attack on Australia, together with the fall of Singapore, really looks like the prelude to invasion. So there is a big flight of people from Darwin. There is also panic in the city and a fair amount of looting. The landings at Bali had begun already at 2 a.m. Carol Dorman's Abda Naval Strike Force is hastily sent in to attack the Japanese ships in three waves, but the four destroyers defending the transports easily handle all three of the waves. Then, the night of the 19th, 14 transports and three destroyers with 4,600 men make landings on both the Dutch and the Portuguese parts of Timor. Portugal is neutral though, and after some internal discussion, the Japanese have decided to offer to withdraw from the Portuguese territory once the Allies have been defeated there, providing that Portugal continues to maintain neutrality, which isn't considered very likely. But we've seen all war long what can happen to neutral or, or overpowered nations, and it happens even at the individual level. On the 14th, the SS Viner Brook is bombed and sunk by Japanese bombers while evacuating people, including many nurses and injured service personnel, from Singapore. Rescue boats with many survivors reached Banka Island, and around 100 of those survivors meet at Ranji Beach. Once there, their senior nurse sends these civilian women and children to Montauk, a town on the island, while an officer of the boat goes to surrender the service people to the occupying Japanese. He returns with around 20 Japanese soldiers who first machine gun any of the men who can still walk after walking them away. The Japanese then come back and rape some of the women and then order all of the women to march into the sea and then machine gun them. Then they bayonet the wounded soldiers on stretchers. Now, one of the nurses, South African Vivian Bullwinkle, survives being shot in the diaphragm and lies in the water until the Japanese leave. She finds British private Patrick Kingsley, who survives bayonetting, and Stoker Lloyd, who survives the men's machine gunning. They still decide to surrender to the Japanese because they will die otherwise. Kingsley does die, but Bullwinkle and Stoker become POWs. 22 nurses and 60 service or crewmen are massacred this day. There are transport planes other than those of the Japanese in the skies this week. On the 17th, 20 transport planes fly out the lead elements of the paratroopers of the Soviet 14th Parachute Brigade. 19 of the planes turn back when they can't find the drop zone and the other one drops into the wrong spot. See, partisans have lit bonfires to show the way, but the Germans have also lit bonfires to confuse them. Still, by the end of the week, 6,988 paratroops have been dropped, hoping to help finish off the fight for Yuknov and to link Pavel Belov's 1st Guards Cavalry and Mikhail Yefremov's 33rd Army within the German confines. On the 17th, Walter Model succeeds in surrounding the Soviet 29th Army west of Rzhev. The Soviet 39th presses in from the west to help free it, but it just becomes a slaughter for everyone. The German presence cannot be reduced. And here are some notes to end the week. On the 14th, the Area Bombing Directive is issued to RAF Bomber Command. Attacks should now be focused on the morale of the enemy civil population and, in particular, of the industrial workers. They will be aiming at the flammable German residential districts now, instead of the actual factories, to try to destroy the workers' houses and not the means of production. The 19th, Maurice Gamelin, 
Paul Reynaud and Léon Blum, a former French army chief of staff and two former French prime ministers, are put on trial in Vichy, France, charged with being responsible for the French defeat in the war. They managed to mostly shift the blame to the whole military establishment. The trial is never finished. That same day, American President Franklin Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066, creating military zones, which clears the way for the detention of Japanese, German, and Italian Americans if and when certain chunks of the U.S. are declared military zones and the military commanders will decide which people must be removed from those zones and incarcerated. And that brings me to the end of the week. A week when Singapore falls and Sumatra, Bali, and Timor are invaded. And also a week when the Japanese bomb Australia and massacre a bunch of powerless prisoners. As for the former, it's not really Pearl Harbor Part 2, since Australia and Japan are actually at war with each other, but it is an attack that mainly does damage to civilian targets, unlike Pearl. And as for the latter, well, you know the saying, all's fair in love and war? Well, it's not true. Some things are just plain not fair and should not happen even in war. We have an entire sub-series that comes out twice a month called The War Against Humanity, hosted by Spartacus Olson, which covers what it says it does. And you can check out the playlist for that right here. Our Time Ghost Army Member of the Week is Jonathan Garrity. Thanks to Jonathan and the Army, we can make all the great content that we make. So join the Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Yes, dot com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.